In this video, we're going to go over some physics problems associated with angular momentum. So let's start with this one. A 10 kilogram disc of radius 3 meters is spinning at 15 radians per second. What is the inertia of the disc? To calculate the inertia of a disc, here's the equation that you need. It's 1 half mr squared. So m is the mass of the disc and r is the radius. 3 squared is 9 and half of 10 is 5. 5 times 9 is 45. So the inertia is 45 kilograms times meter squared. Now let's calculate the angular momentum of the disk. Linear momentum is mass times velocity. So angular momentum is inertia times omega. So this is the equation that you need to calculate angular momentum. So we have the inertia, it's 45, and the angular speed is 15. So it's 45 times 15, which is 675. And that's it for part B. Now let's move on to our second question. The angular momentum of a rod changes from 15 to 35 kilograms times meter squared times radians per second in four seconds. What is the average torque on a rod? Now if we think about it, we know that linear momentum is mass in motion. Anything that's moving has momentum. Well, angular momentum is very similar, but for objects that it's spinning. Any object that rotates or spins has angular momentum. Now, to calculate the net force acted on an object, you can use this equation. It's equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. So similarly, if we wish to calculate the net torque, it's equal to the change in the angular momentum divided by the change in time. Now, both equations can come from Newton's second law. This comes from Newton's second law of motion, which states that the net force acting on an object is the mass times the acceleration. And this expression comes from Newton's second law as it relates to rotation of motion, which states that the net torque acting on an object is equal to the inertia of the object times the angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is the change in the angular velocity divided by the change in time. And momentum is inertia times omega. So the change in momentum, that is the change in angular momentum, is the inertia times the change in angular velocity. So therefore, we can replace I times delta W with delta L. So thus we have this expression. The net torque is equal to the change in the angular momentum of a system divided by the change in time. So now let's go ahead and calculate the average net torque using that equation. So it's equal to the change in angular momentum, which is the difference between those two numbers. That's 35 minus 15 divided by the change in time. So the change in angular momentum is 20. And if we divide that by 4, we'll get the average net torque, which is 5 newtons times meters. So this is the answer. So because the angular momentum is increasing, the net torque acting on the system is positive. If L was decreasing, then the net torque acting on the system will be negative. Number three, a force of 300 newtons acts on a 2.5 meter long rod initially at rest as shown in a picture below. What is the torque acting on the rod? The torque is the force times the lever arm. The force is 300 newtons and the lever arm or the moment arm is 2.5 meters. So 300 times 2.5, that's 750. So the torque is 750 newtons times meters. Now let's move on to part B. What is the final angular momentum of the rod if the force acts on it for eight seconds? Now the torque acting on the system, the net torque, is equal to the change in the angular momentum of the system divided by the change in time. So if we multiply both sides by delta t, 
the torque multiplied by time is equal to the final momentum minus the initial angular momentum. Now the rod was initially at rest, so the initial angular momentum is zero. So therefore, to calculate the final angular momentum, it's simply the torque multiplied by the time. So it's going to be 750 times a time value of 8 seconds. So the final angular momentum is 6,000 units. Now let's move on to part C. What is the final angular speed of the rod? Now keep in mind, angular momentum is equal to inertia times angular velocity or angular speed. So since we have the final angular momentum, we could calculate the final angular speed. However, we do need to calculate the inertia of the rod first. So for a rod where the axis of rotation is at the end of the rod, the inertia is one-third ml squared. So m is the mass of the rod which I did not give you for some reason. So let me do that now. Let's say the mass of the rod is 10 kilograms. And L is the length of the rod. So that L is not the same as the angular momentum L. So the length of the rod is 2.5. So 2.5 squared times 10 divided by 3 is 20.83. So that's the inertia of the system. So to calculate the final speed, we need to take the final angular momentum and divide it by the inertia. So that's 6,000 divided by 20.833. And so the final angular speed is going to be about 288 radians per second. So now let's calculate how much work was done by the force. And we're going to do it two ways. So you may want to write down the numbers that you see here because I need to erase all the stuff that's here. So the first way in which we can calculate the work done is by calculating the change in rotational kinetic energy of the object. Now the initial kinetic energy is zero. So therefore, the work is equal to the final rotational kinetic energy. And the equation for rotational kinetic energy is 1 half inertia times omega squared. So the inertia of the object was 20.83. And it's really 0.83 repeated. The final angular speed was 288 radians per second. And let's not forget to square it. So this will give you, if you round it to nearest thousand, it's 864,000 joules. So that's how much work was done by the force to accelerate it to a speed of 288 ratings per second. The second way to get it is to use this equation. Work is equal to the rotational torque multiplied by the angular displacement. The angular displacement, you can calculate it from this equation, it's one half the initial plus the final angular speed multiplied by the time. So the torque we said was 750. The initial angular speed is 0. The final angular speed is 288. And the time was 8 seconds. So half of 288 is 144. So that's the average angular speed. So it's 750 times 144 times 8 which will give you the same answer of 864,000 joules. So as you can see, there's multiple ways in which you can calculate the work done. Number four, so we have a 500 kilogram merry-go-round with a radius of 10 meters, and it's moving at a speed of 0.5 radians per second. A child jumps on it four meters away from the central axis of rotation. What is the inertia of the merry-go-round? And then let's find the inertia of the child. So let's say this is the merry-go-round. And this is the central axis of rotation. So here's the center. It has a radius of 10 meters and a mass 
is 500 kilograms. So we can treat the merry-go-round as a disk, and the inertia of a disk is one half mR squared. So that's going to be one half times the mass of 500 times the radius of 10. So 10 squared is 100 times 500 times 0.5. So the inertia of the merry-go-round is 25,000 kilograms times meter squared. Now part B, we need to calculate the inertia of the child on the merry-go-round. So here's the child. The child is 4 meters away from the center of rotation. Now the inertia of the child is going to be mR squared. It's not 1 half mR squared because the mass of the child is all concentrated at that point. Whereas the mass of the disk is uniformly distributed throughout this whole circle. So the inertia of the child is going to be the mass which is 50 or rather 40 kilograms multiplied by the radius of 4 squared. That's how far the child is away from the axis of rotation. So the inertia of the child is only 640. So now how can we use that information to calculate the final speed of the merry-go-round? Now what you need to know is that the momentum of the system will be conserved. The angular momentum of the system will not change unless there's a net torque acting on it. So if the child jumps on a merry-go-round, let's say if the child jumps straight down, the child will not exert a torque on the merry-go-round. And so the total momentum will have to be the same. So the initial angular momentum must be equal to the final angular momentum. So that is the inertia of the merry-go-round times the initial speed of the merry-go-round is equal to the inertia of the child plus the merry-go-round times the final speed. So the inertia of the merry-go-round, that's 25,000. The initial angular speed is 0.5 radians per second. Now the inertia of the merry-go-round plus the child is 25,000 plus the 640, so it's 25,640 times the final angular speed. So to calculate the final angular speed, it's going to be 25,000 times 0.5 divided by 25,640. So the final angular speed is 0.488 radians per second. So let's talk about what's going on here. When the child jumps on the merry-go-round, the inertia of the whole system increases. And when the inertia increases, the angular speed has to decrease so that the momentum of the system, specifically the angular momentum, is conserved. And that's what's happening. So whenever the child jumps on a merry-go-round, the speed of the merry-go-round decreases slightly. If the child were to jump off the merry-go-round, the inertia would decrease and the angular speed of the merry-go-round would increase again. So the angular momentum must be conserved if there is no net torque. Another example that illustrates this is imagine if you have a skater. And let's say the skater has her arms stretched out. And at the same time, she's spinning. Let's say she's spinning at a rate of 2 radians per second. And let's say her inertia, I'm just going to pick up a number, let's say it's 10. So her angle of momentum is 10 times 2 is 20. Now let's say if she brings her arms close uh, to her body, so let's say I'm just going to draw a picture, what do you think is going to happen to her angular speed while she's spinning and she brings her arms closer to her body? By moving her arms closer to her body, the inertia changes. Her inertia decreases. So her inertia may now be, let's say, 5. So therefore, if she decreases the inertia, her angular speed has to increase. So if the inertia reduces by a factor of 2, the angular speed will increase by a factor of 2. So it's going to be 4 radians per second, such that the momentum 
is still 20. So she's going to be spinning a lot faster. And so that's another example of the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is always conserved when the net torque acting on the system, meaning an external torque, is zero.